Most people don't use this. 
Most people use things like MySQL, right? Uh, okay. Now, how today's going to play out is we're going to do a review and uh, an example of implementing system calls and actually, you know, how the stacks work when you've got multiple processes going at the same time. And then, following that, we are going to go over A to A. And just by show of hands, how many of you attended the TA's tutorial for A to A? A couple people. All right. No worries. Uh, they went over essentially the same slides that I'm going to go over. Uh, our TAs are, are new, so there may be some additional bonus information you get. And of course, since this is on video, everybody gets it too, right? So we will go over the A2A slides. They are posted to Piazza, by the way, already. Uh, okay, so we left off talking about implementing system calls. And if you don't remember what the system calls were, let's go back in time here. So I just want to go back to this slide. So system calls. Anytime you want the operating system to do something for you, you can't just directly call an API function and can start directly communicating with the kernel. Because we have this concept of execution privilege. We have unprivileged mode and privileged mode. And there are certain instructions that we, the user, should not be allowed to execute while the CPU is in unprivileged mode. Because it is a mode on your CPU. We, the user, should not be able to access the kernel's memory. We should not be able to halt the CPU or do anything like that. And so this privilege mode is actually going to prevent us from doing this. So we have these system calls, which are things that we want the kernel to do on our behalf, but we can't actually call them ourselves. Now, what are the system calls? They're things like fork, exec, b, wait, pid, get pid, anything related to processes, really. Anything related to files, reading, writing, opening, close, all of those things are system calls. And we are going to make these function calls. You're um, making a lovely shadow up there. <laughs> so these are, all of these things are system calls. We need the operating system to do them for us. But if we were to provide the API and the data structures to the user, it's a security risk. And it's also a problem of good abstract design when we be followed. And if we patch the OS, then we actually have to patch the user applications. We don't want to do that. So we have what's known as a system called library, which provides the user programs these nicely named functions, and by some magic is able to get the kernel to do something without actually calling any kernel functions. And if you remember, how we actually get the kernel to do this is by raising an exception. So we are actually going to raise an exception which is going to cause our CPU to flip into privilege mode. And remember now, all of our threads have two stacks. So when we flip from unprivileged mode to privilege mode, we're going to switch from our user stack to our kernel stack for that thread. We save the trap frame, and then we're going to call our exception handler to figure out what kind of exception was just raised. We'll see it's a system call. And so we'll call the system call exception handler, which will then be responsible for going, oh, yes, I see you want to fork a new process. Well, let me do that for you. And then we will return the results to the user program through some predetermined registers. So let's actually go back over an example of this. And uh, if you're following along in the slides, the example starts on page 26. And so what we've got here is we've got the kernel running in privilege mode. And we've got some processes, which of course are the user side of the world, and they run in unprivileged mode. We're only going to deal with two processes here. So my user process is executing some code, and all of a sudden, it decides, hey, I'd like to fork a new one. And so it calls fork. That is the system call library. It lives in user land. And what that's going to do is if you were to look at the implementation of the system call library's version of fork, what it does is it loads into register v0 the system call code. So into v0, this is our system call code. <coughs> 
Now, fourth has no parameters. But if it did, int registers a0 to a3, this is where we would, if we had them, put system call parameters. That is, setting a the value in the register to tell the operating system which system call you would like. Setting up the parameters, we use the instruction syscall to actually raise the exception. When the exception is raised, the CPU is going to immediately flip to being in privileged mode. It's going to disable interrupts. And then it is going to execute the piece of code in OS161 known as common exception, which is our high level exception handler. What common exception is going to do then is it's going to first find the kernel stack for the running thread, and then it is going to switch from using the user stack to the kernel stack. So we are in privilege mode. We now have access to the kernel stack for this thread. We are now ready to save our trap frame. So we save our trap frame, and then we're going to call MIPS trap. Now MIPS trap in OS161, since MIPS treats all exceptions and interrupts as exceptions, what MIPS trap's job is to do is to figure out what kind of exception has actually been raised. Was this an interrupt? Was this a memory fault? Was this a system call? And MIPS trap will then call the handler that is specific to that exception. So we're going to execute MIPS trap. Now, after we check that is this an interrupt or not, and we realize it's not an interrupt, MIPS trap will turn exceptions and interrupts back on. Which means that while we are executing our system call, we can be interrupted. Keep that in mind. All right. MIPS trap then discovers this is a system call, interrupts are back on. It's now time to figure out what kind of system call has been raised. And so what's going to happen is MIPS trap is going to call syscall, which is the system call dispatcher, and it is going to pass it the address of the trap frame, because it is in the trap frame where the values stored in B0 through A3 can actually be found and used. So we call syscall. Inside of syscall, we will look at trap frames from register V0. By the way, in OS161, trap frame is actually a structure, and it has a field for every register. You will become very familiar with this on A2A, of course. Uh, so you're going to look at register V0, and that's going to tell you which system call we actually want to run. And there's a great big old switch statement in there. We'll look at it in a bit. And you will call. The function is sysfork because we want to fork. Now, interrupts are on, which means you can be preempted while executing sysfork. So now what happens to our stacks if we have a timer interrupt? What happens then if there is an interrupt? What's the first thing that's going to happen? <coughs> Yeah? Trap frame? Yes, a trap frame. Because when we receive the interrupt or exception, the CPU, it's already in privilege mode, so it doesn't have to make the switch. It's going to disable interrupts and call common exception. And common exception is going to produce the trap frame. So, timer interrupt. We call common exception and push a trap frame onto the kernel stack. Because since we were already in privilege mode and already using the kernel stack, You'll actually know in the common exception code, we check this, and if we're already using the kernel stack, we don't do anything, we just save the trap frame thread. So, I save my trap frame. Interrupts are still off. Now I call MIPS trap to figure out what just happened. And inside of MIPS trap, I'm like, oh yes, this is a hardware interrupt. And so MIPS trap is going to call the interrupt handler, which is known as main bus interrupt. And interrupts are still off. While we are handling interrupts from hardware, we don't want to handle other interrupts from hardware because 
This is behavior that is outside the control of the thread that was running, and we don't want to disrupt it for too long, so generally leave them off. They will get turned back on, by the way. So we call main bus interrupt to figure out which piece of hardware has actually thrown this interrupt. And in main bus interrupt, we discover, oh, it's the clock. And so we call the interrupt handler for the clock. And in the interrupt handler for the clock, it says, oh, you have exceeded your scheduling quantum. I better preempt you. And so the clock's interrupt handler is going to call thread you, which calls thread switch and then switch frame. And at that point, remember that switch frame is going to save some of our registers and then load the switch frame of another thread and pop its switch frame off its stack. So we are actually now going to context switch over to process two, which had already been running. And we get the switch frame popping off the stack, returning to thread switch, which restores and pops off the stack, which returns to thread yield. That returns to the interrupt handler, returns to main bus, mitts trap, and then we go back to common exception where we restore the trap frame. And by the way, we are turning interrupts back on. And then once the trap frame is restored, that other process goes back to using its user stack. It resets the CPU back to being in unprivileged mode. And now we can go back to having process to thread running its regular user program. So it looks very similar to when we actually did uh, context switches with threads, except now we have two stacks for every thread, and these threads are actually encapsulated in processes themselves. All right. Now, what would this have looked like if we had not have had that timer interrupt? All right. So let's go back in time and suppose the timer interrupt hadn't occurred. Now what you'll actually see here, so we've got trap frame, knit trap, sys call, sys fork. Sys fork is going to create a new process, something we're going to be talking about today. And then it's going to return to system call. And at the very end of sys call, the dispatcher that is, it's going to set the return value and success or failure values for that system call. So system calls in the operating system, they don't just return one thing, they actually return two things. So into register A3, I'm going to put success or failure. And in an operating system, we generally use zero as success and one for failure. And so if it is a successful fork, then in register B0, I put the return value. If it fails, then in A3, I put one. And in B0, I put the error code. And then the last thing I do as a part of the system called dispatcher is I increment the program counter because when the exception is raised, we didn't actually increment it. Uh, and so we need to actually increment the program counter manually so I don't keep executing the system call exception. Don't forget that part. Although this is already there for you. Yes? You had the, the timer switch like last time go before like incrementing PC. So in that case, wouldn't process two not have PC incremented? So for a context switch, that's taken care of for you. Okay. Yeah, but for system call exceptions, because that is an exceptional behavior, and that was actually an instruction that caused it, the program counter didn't get incremented, and now we need to move beyond it, so we have to manually do that. Whereas with the timer interrupt, it's not an instruction we're executing, so it's okay for us to re-execute whatever we choose to All right, once we've set up the return values for the sys call, we will return to MIPS trap. Uh, we will then, from MIPS trap, we immediately return to common exception. And a common exception, of course, we are going to restore the trap frame from the kernel stack onto the CPU. We will switch the stack pointer back to pointing to the user stack. 
And then we're going to use this magical instruction called RFE. And RFE is a magic instruction to switch from privilege mode back to unprivileged mode. So that's going to change the privilege mode back to unprivileged mode on the CPU. And now we jump back to wherever we were interrupted from in the user program. Now, a couple things to point out. These diagrams here are almost always on either a midterm or final exam. So make sure you understand the different things that need to go on each of these stacks. The other thing that I want to say is it is not possible for you to have two trap frames back to back in OS 161. And the reason for that is because when the exception is raised at the CPU, interrupts are turned off. And they do not come back on again until at least halfway through mixed trap, which means that each trap frame must be separated by at least mixed trap. So you cannot have two trap frames back to back on this desk. You just can't. Yeah. So the common exception returns how do we know if we should switch the, switch the mode and uh, change the stack? That's done for you already. So that's actually in common exception. So common exception if will actually check and it will make the switch for you. Uh, so for example, on the previous example, if, if the uh, timer effect Oh yeah, that that code is also inside of um, and all of that is already in common exception. So what it does is that it actually has a means of differentiating between am I using my kernel stack or am I using the user stack? It's actually quite easy to do as you'll see when we talk about virtual memory. And so what it does is it performs a check to see am I using the kernel stack right now? And if I am, then there's no point in switching to it. And if I am switching from kernel back to kernel mode, it knows that and it won't do anything. So if you actually look, there's a lot more assembly to that function than just saving the trap frame. It's actually quite smart at figuring out what was I doing and what am I doing now. Lots, lots of assembly. All right. Yes. Can you explain what happens if Yeah. So it's very possible that yes, indeed, there are system calls that need more parameters than just the four registers that we have assigned to them. In those cases, what we would do is we would actually create uh, an array of parameters and store it in usually the stack of the user program, sometimes the heap. And then what we will do is we pass through just one of these registers a pointer to that array of parameters. That would actually, so whether we need to use that or not would be defined by the kernel's application binary interface, which would be the little bit of information that the kernel provides to the user program about what do you need to do in order to send the parameters. So that's actually, the kernel will tell you that. All right, yes? Uh, so the user program cannot assess the kernel stack, right? But then it has kernel, like the kernel program assess user stack. So you are correct. The user program cannot access the kernel stack, but the kernel can absolutely access your user stack. And in fact, when you are implementing uh, A2A and A2B, you are going to be doing just that. <laughs> Fun stuff. All right, so what I'd like to do now then, uh, we are going to just finish up with the last bit of processes and then we will move on to our a to stuff, which I know is what you all actually want to hear, right? <laughs> you need something to do over reading week, right? Other homework. Other homework. You guys are unlucky. When I was an undergrad here, we never got reading week. I think near the end of my undergrad career, we got reading day. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, we have given you the impression that processes are completely isolated from each other. 
And due to how they are implemented in the virtual memory that we're about to start on Wednesday's class, yes, processes are isolated from each other. But that does not mean processes can't actually talk to each other. Processes can obviously talk to each other. They need to be able to talk to each other. Uh, this is something that I have done. I once created this big application where I wanted motion capture software, which was its own process, to send data to Unreal Tournament so that I could have characters in Unreal being animated in real time by my actors who were pretending to be a dragon. <coughs> yes, they were pretending to be a dragon because it was funny. Uh, so obviously then, I had two processes and they were talking to each other. How is that possible? Well, it's possible through something called inter-process communication. And there are many, 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 many different ways that you can actually do this. One of the simplest things that you can do that does not require anything extra on your part is to use a file. And the idea is you have one process that is going to write data to the file, and the other process reads data from the file. Voila! Those two processes are now talking to each other. Now, this starts to become a problem, obviously, because now I can have a process reading and writing the file at the same time. So it does get a little tricky with respect to synchronization on the file. But generally speaking, uh, for many applications, a file is more than sufficient to let two processes talk to each other. And on that note, there's another thing you can do called shared memory. So what we can do is we can actually set aside a region of memory and say, hey, process A and process B, you may both access this one region of memory. And then the one process can put its data in, the other process can read its data from it. This lets the processes actually work together. Unfortunately, if you take the shared memory approach, we are also um, requiring some synchronization on that. And it's not a very flexible way of doing IPC. It's not very safe. Uh, aside from doing file or shared memory-based IPC, your operating system actually has a variety of system calls available to do just this. And that is things like message passing or queues and pipes, which will actually let use the operating system to manage the passing of data from one process's address space to the other process's address space, or to some place where they can actually retrieve that information and use it. Now, advantages. Obviously, all of these things are going to let us have the processes talk to each other. Disadvantages. The methods that I have described so far require that both processes actually live on the same machine. Yeah, well, what if I don't want that? What if I want two processes on two different computers to talk to each other? What do you do then? You use sockets and networking. That's it. Sockets and networking, the internet, your web browser is a way for you, a Chrome process, to interact with some other process on some other machine. That's all it is. It's a form of inter-process communication. So there are lots of different ways. We don't really focus on these, uh, but I do want to make you aware of them. And if you have any questions about them, by all means, let me know. And if you're curious to know a little bit more about some of these, I know Ali's slides actually have a much more detailed explanation. All right. So, A to A, right? So as I said, that's the end of processes, by the way. Uh, we are going to spend probably the rest of this lecture just looking at how to implement A to A. And this guide here is available on Piazza as well as all the other assignment guides. Okay. So for assignment A to A, you need to implement four of the five system calls for processes. They are fork, get PID, wait PID, and exit. Those are the four process system calls you're going to implement for A2A. 
And um, some advice before we get into actually implementing them and talking about how to implement them. These slides are presented in a specific order. And it is my very um, stern recommendation to you. You implement the slides in order. Uh, and in particular, one thing I want to say is do not proceed to the next function until you are 100% convinced that the previous function worked. And these slides are going to recommend that you implement four first. And I know it is ever so tempting to implement get PID first. Because get PID is one line of code. But how in the hell do I test get PID if I've only got one process? That's boring. If you want to be able to test all of these things, you need to do fork first. Implement fork, and then in the five minutes before you submit your assignment, implement get PID. Save it till the end. The other functions are going to take much, much longer than get the ID. All right. So just a refresher on what these system calls are other than get the ID, because it's obvious. Uh, Fork is going to create a new process. And the new process is going to be a clone of its parent, which means not that uh, it's everything, the PID is the same and so on. The PID will be different. It will actually be a separate physical process, but the contents of the address space will be the same. So the program counter, the stacks, all of those things will be the same between the two processes. <coughs> then we have exit, which is terminating the running process. And it lets you leave behind a status for, oh, I completed with error code Seven, or I completed and my dying wish was 42. And that message is left behind for your parent should they wish to know about why you died and whatever you left behind. Then we have wait PID, which is done for synchronization. It acts as, um, as kind of like a join because what it does is if you call wait PID on a process, you are going to block until that other process terminates. And for wait PID, remember you can only call it on your children, not your grandchildren, not your parents, not your aunts, your cousins, only your children. It's the only people we care about. All right, so let's actually start looking at how do we actually implement all of these lovely things. And uh, on that note, if you haven't been using source control, now is the time to start. There's Git, and we have tutorials on the course website for how to use Git. I don't use Git, so if you are having issues with Git, please talk to our TAs. Um, I'm more than happy to help you with Perforce, or Mercurial, or SVN, or CVS, but I'm not helping you with Git. Anything with Git. Uh, you need it for this time. Don't rely on the student server snapshots for going back in time. You really are going to want to have some kind of source control for this assignment. Because as you're going to see, the code is fairly straightforward to implement, but debugging this is an absolute nightmare of race conditions and deadlock. So, yeah, you're going to want source control. And if source control is not your thing, buy a new laptop each time you write a line of code. Uh, can we use any have a private repo? Can you use a private repo? Yeah. I don't care what you use. I just want you to use something. <laughs> something, please. All right. So here's the outline of what you need to do in core. <laughs> So first thing we're going to do is you need to create a new prop structure for your new process. And after you've created your new process structure, you need to create a new address space. Because our processes do not share address spaces. They have their own address spaces. So for your new process, 
you need to create a new address space. And it needs to be identical to the parent processes. So it needs to be the same size, the same layout, and the contents need to be the same. So you create the address space, and then you're going to copy the contents of the parent's address space into the child processes address space. Once you have verified that that works, and you need to make sure that you verify that works, you can attach that address space to the new process structure. Now you might be thinking, oh, that's so ready to go, right? No. Processes cannot run if they have no threads. But also, this new process you created, it doesn't have a PID. And you haven't set up the parent-child relationship. So before we get this process going, let's finish setting it up. So you've got the structure. You've got the address space copied and created and added to the structure. Since that's going to succeed, it's safe to create a PID. To create your PID. However you want. Then set up the parent-child relationship. Remember, you need to know who your children are. Because when I call Wake PID, I can only call them on my children. So if I call Wake PID and I pass it ID 7315, and that's not one of my children, Wake PID needs to return an error. You can only know it's an error if you know who your children are. So you need some way of keeping track of the parent-child relationship. And once you have that done, you are now ready to give your new process a thread. And so you create a new thread for that process. And what's interesting is what you need to do when you create this new thread for this new process, you need to pass the trap frame of the parent's thread and put it on to the kernel stack for the child thread. Because both processes are going to return from fork, which means we need the context of where the parent was sent to the child thread. Because when you create a thread, it's empty. So I need to take the context from the parent thread, and I need to put it on the child's thread. And that's it. And inside, and that's it for the parent, but inside the child process, after you have put the trap frame onto its stack, the child process has to call MIPS user mode. And the reason why it has to call MIPS user mode is because even after you put the trap frame onto the child's kernel stack, the child process does not raise a system call exception. The child process has never executed a line of code in its life. And so you need some way of when the child process's thread is scheduled to run, you need some way to fake a return from an exception. And you do that with a call to mix user mode. It will fake the return from the exception so that the thread for the child process can go back to user mode and continue running after returning from four. Now that may seem like a lot of work that you actually need to do. OS 161 has actually done a lot of it for you. You just have to make use of it. So, the first part then. We need to create a process structure for the child process. And you might be thinking, all right, well, I've got to do struct star proc equals malloc size of struct proc. No. We have a lovely function in OS 161 that can do us for it, this for us, and it's called prop create run program. It will create the process structure and populate some of the fields with values for you. Now I want to point out, if you were to open the prop structure, which is in curd include prop.h, you will note that many of the fields that you need for this assignment do not exist. It doesn't have a PID field. You need to add it. Do not remove anything that is already in the structure, but you can add whatever you need to it. So you're welcome to modify, just don't remove anything. Now, prop create run program, as it turns out, can return an error. It can return null, which means that it did not create a new process structure. 
And if it didn't create a new class of structure, why might that happen? Well, in OS 161, we have no memory management whatsoever, which means that there's a good chance when you try to create a new process, there's no memory for that process to run in. And so if it returns null, it usually means that, hey, we ran out of memory. You need to, in your implementation of port, check to see if prop create run program returned null. And if it does, you need to from port return the appropriate error code for the situation. Now, are we going to be testing your code for these things? No, we're not. Uh, so you're like, why well, should I check for errors then if all of your tests succeed? Because we want you, when you are running your own tests, if there's an error because you've implemented something incorrectly, wouldn't you like to know why it happened? <laughs> So for your own sanity, do the error checking so that debugging is easier. And yes, uh, you heard me correctly. All of our tests are successful tests. That is, we do not test you under situations where the process failed or we called wait PID on someone who wasn't our child. No, no, they're all totally bland. I'll show you them in a minute. All right, so you've got your process structure. It's succeeded. Now you need to create the address space and copy the contents from the parents into it. Well, guess what? You don't have to do that either. Because OS 161 has provided the function to you. You just need to use it. And the function that you want to look at is called AS copy. Now, that is going to allocate the memory for the address space for you. So do not manually allocate the space for the address space. AS copy does it for you, and AS copy, after allocating the space, also copies it over. Then, depending on how you've done this, you need to check to make sure that AS copy succeeded. AS copy can return an error. Make sure you check that and return that from fork should that happen. Uh, otherwise, after you have uh, successfully gotten new address space, you should attach that address space to the process structure. There is a safe way to do this, and there's a function that you can look at but not use uh, that will give you an example, however, of how to safely set an address space, and that's perproc set as. You should not be calling perproc set as because that changes your address space. You want to change the address space of the new process. So, curproxs is just an example of how to safely set an address space of a process. All right. We've got a process structure. We've got our address space. We've checked for errors. Now we're ready to do the PID. Yep. So for modifying the process, uh, the process structure, should we also be modifying the uh, process from program program to like, initialize the new fields for the app? Yep. But that's up to you. Right, how is that if you're allowed to? Oh, yes, you're absolutely allowed to. You are um, allowed to modify at this point anything you want. That is both nice and also dangerous. <laughs> yes. So, um, can we call curve process set as, like, in the user code program? Nope. Oh. No, you don't. All right. Now it's time to assign a process ID number to our child process. Now, some people do it at this point. Other people I have seen set the PID when they actually create the process in prop create or prop create run program. That is up to you. We are not going to tell you how to implement your process ID numbers. But I can give you some suggestions. Number one, you will note that in a real operating system, process ID numbers should be reusable. Because obviously you will run out of integers otherwise. Ah, do you need to make your process ID numbers reusable for OS 161? No, you don't. Despite what the slides say, you do not need to make your PIDs reusable. Why? Because we can't test them. 
Yeah. We can't. OS161 is too late for us to actually write a test to test this. Uh, number two, because we don't want to look at your code. <laughs> so you do not have to implement reusable PIDs. What does that mean? You can have a global counter and just keep incrementing it. Yes, you can. <laughs> That's what I do. Why do more work than you have to? If we can't test it and we're not looking, then you can't lose marks for it, so why bother putting the effort in? That's what undergrad's about, right? What is the least amount of work you can do to get the highest grade? I was an undergrad once, I know what it's I know all about that trick. All right, so you can use a counter. If you have a global counter, however, remember that consistent calls that interrupts are on, which means that concurrency is still happening and multiple ports could be executing simultaneously, which means that multiple threads could be trying to access your global process counter at the same time. So guess what you need? A lock. You can use a spin lock, you can use a lock, you can use a binary semaphore, I don't care. Where do you create a global lock to be used for this operating system? There is a magical function called proc bootstrap. And I'm going to let you use grep and find what file that lives in. But inside proc bootstrap, at the very bottom of proc bootstrap, it is safe for you to initialize uh, whatever mutual exclusion method you're going to use for your prop counter, if that is what you do. Now, if you do want to use a reusable PID, you are welcome to. Uh, I have seen people create an array of all of the available PIDs, and then uh, mark them as in use or not in use. If you choose to use a reusable PID, and you're thinking, I'll create a structure size 10,000, please don't. <laughs> um, number one, we're not generating that many processes. Uh, we don't really generate more than 32. Uh, so if you create maybe an array of 64, that's enough. But also, if you make it bigger, uh, when it comes to assignment three, and we do this to your memory, you're going to have a bad time. So yeah, keep it small. <laughs> really small. Uh, and on that note, if you decide to do process management and parent child relationships with the global process table, do not make some giant process table because we will not be generating that many processes. And number two, you don't have that much memory to play with. So keep it small, less than size 100. Now, you want a real easy way to do a reusable PID? Don't you think the um, address of your process structure is unique? So you can technically use it, but word of warning, addresses are unsigned and the PID is signed. So you may have to do a little shift math to, uh, to make that work out. I don't care what you do. I really don't. Just make it work. That is the rule of this course. We don't care how you did it. Just make it pass the test. <laughs> All right. So. You've created your PID, you've got mutual exclusion on any global structures that you create in order to do this. I don't care if you made it reusable. Now you've got to set up the parent-child relationship. That is not on this slide. What do you need to do for the parent-child relationship? Again, this is 100% your decision, how you keep track of this. I have seen people do global process tables. I have seen people do process trees. I don't care. Just make it work. One of the easiest things that you can do is each process can have a pointer to its parents and an array of pointers to its children. That works. Or you can keep track of the PID of your parents and the PIDs of your children, but if you do it by PID, then you will also need a global process table where you can actually look the PIDs up and get the address of the corresponding structure to. I don't care what you do, just make it work. Now, you're going to be tempted to create an array for your parents, but this is the world of processes and operating systems, and you only have one parent. 
So don't make an array for your parents, because you only have one or none. And to make sure you initialize things to null, or you're going to have a bad time. All right. Now, you've got your PID, and you've got your uh, parent-child relationship set up in some mystical, magical way. Now, you actually need to create a thread for your new process. How do you create a thread for a process? Well, you call thread for it. <laughs> Except this time, when you call thread for it, we are going to set the second parameter of thread for to be the pointer to the child process. Because the second parameter of thread for is meant to be the process to whom this thread is going to be attached. Two. We want to attach it to our child process, so we pass that structure through the second parameter. Yes? So in the diagrams you showed us in previous classes, the process itself had a thread array? Yes. So I would, I would assume that like the threads are the thread structure physically in our process is memory space? Yes. So um, this thread fork, would that, would that not be in our parent processes? Yes, but I'm the kernel. I can do whatever I want. So, all memory is mine. So, if the kernel is actually the one who manages the process structures themselves. All of the process structures live in the kernel. And so, the process, uh, what, or the kernel, when we create a new thread, we can ask the kernel in thread for it to put it in a specific process structure thread array. And that's actually, if you look at thread force implementation, it actually attaches it to the thread array of the past process. And if you pass null, it, it does it to the current. Yep? Yeah. Uh, so, isn't the code a part of the address space? Is it which? The, the code. That's ah, so that's the tricky part of calling thread for here. In order to call thread fork, you have to pass it a function for that thread to run. What are you passing it to run? Uh, I mean, like, when, when you copy the address, uh, shouldn't we just already copy the code and we just set the uh, PC and everything to work? Sure, you did create the address space for the child process, but the child process needs a thread. The thread structures themselves are not a part of the user program's address space. The address space is just the code, the heap, and the stack. It does not include the actual thread structures themselves. The thread structures along with the process structure actually live in the kernel's memory, not the address space of the user program. Okay. All right. That does raise an interesting thing, though. What function do I pass the thread for? Because when you call thread for, you have to give the new thread an entry point function to tell it which code to start executing. Well, what do I want my thread to start executing? Well, this new kernel thread, or this new thread that I just created, I need to have some way of having that new thread, which is brand spanking new, go back to the exact same state as the thread that's running in the parent process. So I need to make it somehow so that my new child process thread will be returning from fork. And this is where we want to take the trap frame, which is the context of the user program that the parent was running, and I want to take that trap frame and I want to put it on the child process's new thread kernel stack. Yes, I know that's a mouthful. So that is the function that I want thread fork to use as the entry point for my new thread. So I'm going to switch to the board here, and I'll post this to Piazza as well. Um, let's that up. So, Although the signature is incorrect and it's empty, 
You can change it to whatever you want, by the way. But if this is a function that I want to pass in the thread fork, it needs two parameters. One of them needs to be a void star, and the other one has to be an unsigned log. Now I want to remind you, not a log, long, <laughs> that thread fork's function pointer parameter must match exactly. You cannot have struct track frame unsigned long. You cannot have something with one parameter. It must match that exactly. And if it doesn't, it's not going to compile. So pay attention to that. Now what I want to do is through this parameter here, I'm going to pass a pointer to my track frame. So I will pass the pointer to my trap frame as the one, two, three, fourth parameter of thread fork. Now, I have the trap frame. It is on the heap or somebody else's stack. I want to put that trap frame on this thread's stack. How do I do it? Well, how do you put anything on the stack? It, you make it a local variable. Local variables are on the stack. So that trap frame that I had passed to the void pointer, I need to make it a local variable. And then, bam, it's on the stack. <coughs> this is pseudocode, by the way. So if I make a spelling mistake, don't worry about it. It's just pseudocode. So there's my trap frame. There we go. Shallow copy is a okay for this task. <coughs> yes, we are missing some casting. I'm going to let you figure that out yourself. <coughs> Voila! My trap frame is now on the kernel stack for my new processes thread. Yep. <coughs> so wait, in C, does that actually relate to a shallow copy? Yep. And the other question I have is that in the trap frame that we're copying over, yep. the pointer like to the stack, I guess, or like wherever it is in memory, um, when you pop that off, it's gonna yes. be now pointing to our original process in on a like I think you know what I mean, right? I I think I know what you're saying. <laughs> Let me finish the discussion of it and hopefully that will answer your question. Sure. All right. Remember there's a trap frame that is the context from your parent thread. So that is all the values in the registers that the parent was doing before it actually called fork. Uh, now, we want fork to return in the user program as well. But fork in the user program or the trial process is going to return a different value. It is going to return zero. And so into this trap frame, we are going to set the return value for fork for the child process. So we will set tf, again, this is pseudocode, there's my return value for fork in the child. And then, because the fork succeeded, I need to also indicate that in register 83 of the trap frame on my stack. Remember that zero is success. And then, here's the problem. The program counter is set to, at this point, the address of the syscall instruction. The parent process is going to return to user mode by returning from the syscall dispatcher to mix track and so on and so forth. So the parent process will increment its own program counter so that it doesn't raise the system call exception again. But the child process did not and is not returning from an exception because it's brand new. So it is not 
going to increment its program counter on its own. Because system call isn't being used here. Which means that you need to increment the program counter for the child process here so that it actually returns from fork and doesn't raise the exception again. The program counter, by the way, is in the trap frame. I'm going to let you discover the trap frame structure and find it yourself. Or you can copy that line of code from the syscall.c file. The last thing that we need to do in this function is have the child processes thread do a fake return from an exception so it can go back to user mode. And that's where we finally call this user mode. It's not too bad. Now, you mentioned before, well, aren't they returning? They have two different address spaces. And isn't this trap frame pointing at the, uh, using the same addresses as the parent? Yes. Also, no. Because those addresses are fake. They're 100% fake. And even though the fake addresses are the same for two processes, what those fake addresses map to is very, very different. So yes, they're the same virtual addresses, but they are different physical addresses. So don't worry about that. That's all we need to do. It's not too bad. But there is a small problem. So, go back to the slides here. Here's the problem. You are the parent's process, and you want to send your trap frame to your child. When does your child run? Because you have passed your child process an address to something that is a part of you on your stack. You may believe that when you call thread fork, the child process runs. No. <laughs> you have no control over that. Sure, we'll create the structure, but the thread structure gets added to the ready queue and you have absolutely no control whatsoever over when your child thread uh, actually runs, which means that the parent process may return from fork and pop the trap frame off of its stack before the child process even tries to look at the contents of said trap frame. Which means that if the parent returns from fork before the child process runs, the trap frame that is passed to the child process will be complete and utter garbage. So you need to synchronize this. And one of the things that you can do is you can force the parent process to wait until the child process executes and takes the trap frame. Yeah, don't do that. That's slow. There's a cheat, and it's so fast and easy. You could do synchronization. Or... How about you make a copy of the parent's trap frame in the kernel's heap? And then you pass the copy that's in the kernel's heap into the child. Because the one that's in the kernel's heap isn't going to go away. And then you just have to make sure that when you call enter for process after you've put the copy onto your stack, you free the version that is in the kernel C. And then you don't need synchronization to do this whatsoever. And it's faster. And easier. But it is, again, your choice. All right. That's it for four. So, let's talk about that. The next functions are wait, PID, and exit. And realistically speaking, after you have verified your fork works, you need to implement and test wait, PID, and exit together. Because they work together. So remember, wait, PID is going to allow us to block until a trial process has terminated. And all our processes will terminate with a call to exit for now. So I'm going to jump ahead to exit just to, because it's like one slide. So um, exit. 
What exit needs to do is just terminate the calling process. Now, exit is past a parameter. And if your parent is alive, you must keep the parameter to exit around. Because if your parent is alive, there is the possibility they will call the API ID on you to try to retrieve that value you passed to exit. So you cannot necessarily completely delete a process in exit. If you are an exit, you can freely delete the entire process only if there is nobody that can call wait the ID on you. That is, if your parent is no longer living. That is the only time in exit you can completely delete yourself. Otherwise, you need to keep that information around. Now, some people. What I've seen them do is they just keep the process structure around and mark it as dead or a zombie. Because a process that is technically not running but still around is a zombie. So you can mark yourself as a zombie and leave the prop structure around. Uh, or you can create a new structure and store it somewhere in the kernel. I, I don't care how you implement this particular, particular functionality. Now, then in wait PID, what you're going to do is you are going to need to check. Is the process which called wait PID my child? This is why you need to know who your children are. If the process is not your child, then return an error code. If the process is your child and they are dead, then you grab the exit status and exit code and you're going to combine them together into a single integer value using a macro I will show you in a minute. And then you simply return that value from wait ID and you're done. Now, of course, if your process is already dead, the child is already dead, and you grab their exit code, you are now done with them. We don't conduct autopsies on our children more than once. So they are dead, you conduct the autopsy, you can now completely delete them. You can bury the zombie in the yard. However, if your child is still alive, you need to go to sleep. The best way I've seen to implement this, and this is by no means the way that you must do it, is give every process a lock and a condition variable and have the parent go to sleep on the child's condition variable. And then when the child calls exit, the child will signal their condition variable to wake the parent back up who can then grab your exit status, fully delete you, and then return. How you do it, however, is up to you. You don't need to use broadcast because you only have one pair. <laughs> All right. Now, some details. After you have called wait PID on one of your children, and that child has terminated, and you've grabbed their exit status and your exit code, and you, you're ready to delete them, it is now safe to reuse that PID if you are doing a reusable process ID number. But not until that state. You also, if you have already called wait PID on your child, 87, and then immediately afterward, before, and then there's no forks in between, you call a uh, wait PID on 87 again, the second wait PID on the same PID should fail. Assuming you have no new child with that number. You can only call it once. We do the autopsy once, and then we bury them. We delete them. So keep that in mind. All right. So, as I said, you need to combine the exit status and the exit code as your return value from fork. And you'll note that for, or not for, wait PID, you will note that in wait PID, the return value actually is a parameter to wait PID. The code stub for this is already there. Just add to it, okay? But to combine the two values together, you need to use this magical macro called mkweightexit. This is going to take 
W exited and combine it automatically with whatever exit message was passed through the exit call. You only pass one value to MKWay exit. You only call MKWay exit if you exited by the exit function. Hence, you don't need to pass it to parameters. If we were to exit by a kill, we would call MKWay exit, we would call MKWay kill. So it's already got half of the value there. You just need to pass it the other half. So it only takes one parameter. It is a macro. It is not a function. So it's, it's defined with a define, okay? Preprocessor. All right. So that's wait PID and exit. Now, when can you fully delete a process? Well, there are a few times. So if you call exit and you have no living parent, fully delete yourself. You're an orphan and nobody cares about you. Uh, if you are exiting and you have dead children, well, you are dead yourself. And since you are dead, a zombie cannot call wait the idea on another zombie. So if you are dead and you have dead children, you can fully delete your dead children. So that's two places where you can fully delete a process. The third place where you can fully delete a process is after calling wait the idea on it. So after the parent process has retrieved your exit status and exit code, then that child process can fully be deleted. So three places where you need to fully delete the process. It, that little bit of code there to synchronize this, is the hardest part of this entire assignment. Make sure you are acquiring the correct locks before you check whether your child is alive or dead. Make sure you are going to sleep on the correct condition variable. I see most people who have trouble with A2A, it is because they either have a race condition around wait PID and exit or deadlock between wait PID and exit. So be warned about that in advance. Now if you're looking at these slides, you'll see this lovely one that says fun extras. And you should read that as, no thanks. <laughs> um, because we have no tests for these things. And if you implement them, we'll never know. So all you did was for your own personal self-gratification, I guess? I, I, don't do it. Yes? Do you care about efficiency of Absolutely not. This is OS. <laughs> I don't care about efficiency. I mean, don't give us an n factorial algorithm, but you know. Uh, the, yeah, th this is about making it work, not making it work quickly. All right, so what are these fun extras for if you have finished every assignment for the whole term and you really, really want that Google job and you've got nothing else to say to them? Uh, so Wait PID actually has a variety of different options. One of them is you can wait on any child to die. So instead of waiting for your favorite child to die by passing their PID, you can just wait for your first child to die. So you would pass a PID of negative one, and then you're waiting on anybody to die. Uh, there's also the ability of instead of blocking, if your child is not dead yet, you just return an, uh, a special value, which is, I, it's W, or it's E child that it does. Uh, so if it returns E child, that means that the child is still alive, and then you need to call wait the ID in a loop. Again, these are fun extras. You should like go outside and enjoy the sunshine before it snows. Or I don't know, like go do something fun, not this. Because if you do this, we won't know. Or care. So it's, it's yeah, don't do it. No problem. One other thing I want to say before I show you the tests that we're going to be running is that make sure that your child process does not have PID zero. Zero is not a valid PID. You should be using PIDs that are bigger than zero. Zero is a special value. Okay, I'm not talking about get PID. If you can't implement one line of code, yeah. All right, I'm not going to say it.
Yeah, if you can't do it, you're in the wrong course. You're literally just returning the field value, okay? <laughs> so if you go under assignment information on our fancy, fancy new website, uh, be sure to read the A to A hints. Always a good idea because for some of the tests we are running, you're going to need more memory. So why fork and fork tests need more than the default amount of memory? We are aware and we will be running them with more memory. But if you want to know how much, read the hints page. What else? So aside from that, we have provided you with the marking report. This assignment is out of 30. And the tests that we will be running are these four here. And only these four here. There are no secret tests. You have the source code to all four of these tests. Because you have the source code to all four of these tests, we will not be answering questions on Piazza about whether you have the correct output or not. Open the code and read it and figure it out. I know that's me, but I mean, it, it, you know, I went 35 and you never got the code, so now you're getting the code. So yes, you have the source code to all of our tests. There are no other secret tests. We are going to run them on one processor. We're going to run them on multiple processors. So you should be testing the same settings. Always test on one first before you move to multiple. Always, because it's easier to debug. Now, what happens if, and I know you have many, many weeks to work on this, because you know there's midterm and there's reading week in there and all. And do it on reading week so you can study for your midterm, OK? Just some advice. Um, <laughs> What happens if you don't get things working? Don't panic. We have mercy marks. So if you get less than 15 on the tests, we will look at your code. And that is the only circumstance on this assignment where we will ever look at your code, is if you get less than 50% on the tests. And in which case, our TAs will peruse your code and try to figure out how much you manage to figure out. And you will get a maximum grade at a 14 for code inspection. Now this is not added to your test score. You will receive the maximum of your test score or the um, code inspection. So if you don't do anything, you still might get some code inspection marks. Sorry. No, our TAs know what the blank code base looks like. They are mercy marks. I want to warn you in advance. A2A or A2B builds on A2A. All of these tests for A2A, we are running again for A2B. So it's very important when the assignment is done and submitted that if you don't have it working, finish it for the next assignment. Because I think it's like 18 out of 50 marks on A2B are just for retesting A2A. All right, I'm going to leave that here. Uh, if you have more questions.